Hello everyone, my name is Nick and I'm a PhD candidate in Professor Cynthia Goh's lab here at the University of Toronto. In this Chem 327 video, I'll be touching on some basics of atomic force microscopy and we'll be introducing you to one of our AFMs, the JPK NanoWizard 2. In the latter half of the video, I'll demonstrate how to run a standard imaging experiment on some super tiny collagen fibrils. All right, let's go check it out. Now that we're through with the glamour shot, let's get started with some basics. First off, AFM is short for Atomic Force Microscope. The primary function of this instrument is in imaging at the nanoscale beyond the limits of optical microscopes, which cannot resolve features smaller than the wavelengths of visible light. It achieves this by literally feeling the surface with a very sharp tip. Imagine a record player, but with a tip scanning the surface that is on the order of tens of nanometers in diameter. To better understand how this translates to an image of the surface, let's begin by looking at the major components of an AFM starting with the laser. We have our probing laser here, which is often in the red or near infrared in wavelength. It strikes the top of the cantilever portion of the AFM probe, which has a reflective coating on the top side. This is what some typical AFM probes look like with the tiny triangular cantilevers visible on the left image there for reference. These probes are often made of relatively tough inert materials like silicon nitride, and their cantilever spring constants vary depending on their application. Last thing to note here is that the size of the AFM tip that probes the surface does indeed limit the resolution of the images you will obtain. If your tip is a little too wide, for example, it may not feel smaller features that are present on the surface. Moving on, after striking and reflecting off the probe, the laser then bounces off an adjustable mirror, which allows for more alignment precision, and ends up on a photodiode, which is made of a silicon-based semiconducting photoactive material to generate a measurable signal when the laser strikes it. This photodiode contains four quadrants that allow for a precise measure of the displacement of the laser spot as the tip position changes during an image scan, as shown here. As the tip makes contact with the surface and scans over features, the cantilever bends back and forth, causing the laser position on the photodiode to shift. These signals from individual photodiode quadrants are fed through a nulling circuit, containing, notably, a series of differential and summing amplifiers, which allow for the exact change in the position of the laser on the photodiode to be quantified. This shift in the vertical position of the laser spot, or what's called vertical deflection, is what the AFM uses to build the topographical images you see here, which give very useful height or Z information and give a qualitative look at features in the XY plane. For example, the image on the left is that of a collagen fibril, which we will be imaging a bit later in this video. What you can see quite clearly in this image is the banding pattern that is uh, unique to collagen fibrils uh, that is on the order of approximately 67 nanometers in width, a feature that you wouldn't be able to see with a typical optical microscope. The two most common imaging modes are contact mode and tapping mode. In contact mode, the probe is in contact with the surface, basically and as such is optimal for harder samples. In this mode, the change in the position of the cantilever, as measured via the vertical deflection signal, is used to output a topography. In tapping mode, on the other hand, the probe is periodically contacting the surface, or tapping the surface, which is optimal for softer samples, including many biological samples such as cells. The change in frequency of the cantilever as the tip probes features that are tall and short or features that go below the baseline of the surface is measured to output the resultant topography. 
In this video, we will be imaging individual collagen fibrils in contact mode. While these are biological samples, they are extremely tough and will not be easily denatured by the AFM probe while imaging. Let's get started. First off, we have to power on the computer and the AFM controller. Next up, we want to make sure the vibration isolation platform is turned on. This platform reduces ambient vibrational noise, which allows for an overall boost in AFM performance. AFMs are sensitive to vibrations through the instrument and even in the air. So when the AFM is imaging, make sure to keep relatively still and talk very quietly if you really need to. Above the platform is an inverted microscope that is the base for the AFM. The microscope allows the user to view the surface and pick specific positions on a sample to measure the surface topography. It is also essential in aligning the laser and AFM probe cantilever, which I will show you shortly. This is the AFM probe holder, which is inserted directly into the AFM itself. It has a strip of clear glass where the laser is able to shine through and strike the cantilever. Here are some typical AFM probes. The bronze colored of which contain contact mode tips and the silver of which contain tapping mode tips. This is the actual AFM. When removing it from the microscope, a light indicator should turn off, letting you know that the laser has shut off, keeping you safe as you insert the AFM probe holder with your AFM tip. This is where you insert your sample of choice. In this case, I had dropped a dilute water-based solution of collagen fibrils, added a droplet to a small piece of mica, which is an atomically flat surface often used in AFM imaging, glued to a standard microscope slide. Gave some time for the collagen fibrils to settle on the surface, rinsed with deionized water, and air dried until ready to image. Now the tough part. We have to pick up our AFM probe of choice with some tweezers and carefully clamp it down on the glass AFM holder. The AFM probes are quite tiny as you can see, which definitely challenges your fine motor skills. Not to mention, you will be dropping and breaking a few AFM tips before you become consistent with this part. This can be especially nerve-wracking as AFM probes can range from $20 to $30 a piece for more basic probes to on the order of $100 per piece for very specialized tips. Pro tip, it's best you practice on your already broken tips over and over again until you've got it. What you want in the end is for the tiny cantilever portion of the probe to be just jutting over into the clear portion of the glass and for the probe to be horizontally aligned. This process varies widely from AFM to AFM. Next up, we have to insert, line up, and secure the AFM probe holder in the center slot of the AFM, followed by placing the AFM back in the secure position on the inverted microscope, which allow for adjusting the position of the AFM relative to your sample. Now we open the AFM software and click a few icons to start the alignment process so we can actually get some images. First off, we're going to click the gear icon, which gives us the Z stepper control. This allows us to move the AFM towards and away from the sample by a given distance, down to the micron scale. Second, the camera icon turns on the microscope digital viewer, which allows us to view the surface, useful especially for laser AFM probe alignment purposes. And third, we click on the photodiode icon to view the position of the laser spot on the photodiode, both visually and through the vertical and horizontal deflection signal values. The overall signal sum there is useful in indicating when we've aligned the laser to probe to photodiode correctly. To begin alignment, we first manually adjust the position of the laser relative to the AFM probe to make sure it is properly striking the cantilever. We rarely adjust the position of the mirror unless we are using different brand probes, so we should get a visible change in the overall signal sum when we strike the cantilever in the first place. This means the laser spot is making its way onto the photodiode. Next up, we adjust the position of the photodiode to define a starting point of the laser spot on the four quadrants. I know I'm moving the photodiode in the right direction when the sum value increases. 
If it decreases, I know I have to turn the knob the other way. The set voltage for vertical and lateral deflections are minus one and zero respectively. We want the laser spot to be slightly offset to the left to maximize the signal generated by the laser spot moving vertically up and down on the photodiode. We don't want it to be stuck between two quadrants limiting the voltage generated. Now we are ready to adjust some parameters before we image the surface. First of which are the I gain and P gain values. In order to ensure that the AFM scans our sample and hugs the surface tightly, it uses a built-in feedback loop to direct the tip closer or farther away from the surface as it quickly scans and interacts with features. These fine adjustments in the Z direction are made possible via a tiny piezo crystal that expands and shrinks in a controlled fashion through an applied voltage. How quickly it directs the tip towards or away from the surface as it scans surface features is controlled by the gain. With a higher gain, the tip more tightly outlines the surface features as it scans. If the gain is too high, however, we end up with noise in the image. If the gain is too low, the piezo response to changes in vertical deflection are slower, resulting in features that are overestimated in size due to worse tracking of the surface. After choosing a starting point for our gain values, we define the scan size. It is quite typical for fibrils to begin with a 50 by 50 micron image size and zoom in when we have found some fibrils on the surface. We will lower the line rate, or the speed by which the tip scans the surface, a tiny bit since the image is pretty large to start, and we do not want to damage the tip. We will leave the image resolution at 512 by 512 pixels. Now let's position our sample under the AFM tip and instruct the tip to land on the surface automatically by pressing the down arrow. In this process, the piezo pushes the tip down as far as it can. If it doesn't sense the surface, aka a change in the vertical deflection, the stepper motor is instructed to push the AFM closer to the sample. This repeats quite quickly until the cantilever of the probe bends when the tip has finally made contact and the AFM is instructed to stop moving towards the surface. Now it's finally time to hit run to start imaging our sample. After some searching, we found our first collagen fibrils. The tip slowly scans revealing more and more of the topographical image. The bar on the right tells us what the height range of our image is, so any white portions on the image are at max about 44 nanometers in height. The height trace view below shows how the height of the features change as the scan continues in real time. Any gain related noise or vibrational noise will show here and if large enough will be visible as small or large streaks in the actual height image above. Here is a side by side showing the height image being produced and the tip scanning the surface at the same time of another set of collagen fibrils. Now that we found many fibrils, the next step would be to stop the run, lift the piezo to retract the tip, and select a new scan region on the last image that was taken. This means we can go ahead and scan one of the collagen fibrils at a much smaller image size to get some more fine detail. To get a better image than what you see here, you can start by changing a few of the parameters in the software, including the gains and set point values. It is also important to ensure your surface is very dry, as tiny bits of water on the surface can affect the tip sample interaction, adding artifacts to your image. You may also want to look out for material from the surface adding to the tip and changing its geometry. In the worst case, your AFM tip could become larger, lowering the overall obtainable detail in your images. There are plenty of other potential artifacts to watch out for, but as this is an introduction to AFM, we'll leave this discussion for another time, or maybe another video. Here are some typical images of collagen fibrils I have taken in the past, including some fibril clusters, individual fibrils with nicely resolved banding patterns, clumps of fibrils, and even fibrils that have been base adjusted, revealing twisted inner workings. Overall, an atomic force microscope is able to achieve 
better spatial resolution in imaging when compared to optical microscopes. AFMs beat electron microscopy for biological imaging of samples that would otherwise be burned under the intense electron beam. With the help of a liquid chamber, we could obtain images of samples in their own native conditions or in physiological conditions, for example, and no staining or other modifications are needed to image your samples. While we focused mainly on imaging this time around, AFMs are actually capable of a whole series of measurements beyond just measuring surface topography. There are so many cool applications and I encourage you to check them out in your own time. Lastly, thank you for watching, good luck on your quiz, and enjoy the rest of the course.